Welcome to Colonial Classics, a food demonstration with the House of the Seven Gables, live in the Gables Cafe Kitchen. Tonight, I'm going to walk you all through making a colonial potato omelet from the early American cookbook, Authentic Favorites for the Modern Kitchen, which you can buy in our museum store. The House of the Seven Gables strives to be a welcoming, thriving historic site and community resource that engages people of all backgrounds in our inclusive American story. Continuing this work takes time, effort, and money. We would like to thank our members who are here tonight and invite you to become a member if you are not. We have some great programs and member events lined up this year. We have included a link for membership in the chat. We have also included a link for donations to help us cover the cost of this demonstration and to support our work as a community resource. Any amount is greatly appreciated. We encourage you to support small businesses in your community whenever you can. This evening, we purchased our spices from Salem Spice in Pickering Wharf. I would personally like to thank all the people who have supported this program and got it running safely during COVID-19, especially Holly Watson, who is here tonight as my support crew. During this demonstration, please turn off your camera and keep yourself muted. If you have a question or comment at any time during this demonstration, please type it into the chat and it'll be read aloud to me. The goal of this demonstration is to connect with everyone. So don't be afraid to engage in the chat either with me or each other. Now, who's ready to get started? Hello. Oh. Hello. So who's ready for some potato facts? <laughs> I found so much on potatoes. This was very similar to when I did all my research on apples. I found a whole website on potato facts. It's very, very fun, especially the history of potatoes. Um, the first thing I need to do is I actually have it made my mashed potatoes, which is the first thing you need to do in this recipe which I will send to everyone tomorrow with the, the thank you email um, and let you know when the, this will go on YouTube. So with your mashed potatoes, you're literally, it's just mashing the potatoes. You're not putting any milk in it or any butter. You can put butter in it. It's not gonna do anything wrong to it. I have tried it and it's fine. Uh, <laughs> this recipe surprisingly for a comfort recipe doesn't call for any butter except for when you're frying it in your iron skillet, but even then it doesn't specify how much butter. We'll get to that later. So potato facts. I'm actually gonna quiz you guys first. So do any of you know where potatoes come from? Any ideas? I'm continuing to mash, mash, mash. Emma says South America. South America, yes. Can you get a little more specific for me? You're right. Correct. Any guesses in there? No one's guessing. They come from Peru. And so they were brought over to Europe from Peru by Spanish conquistadors. And then they're brought over to the Americas again <laughs> um, by Scotch Irish immigrants who were moving to London, Derry, New Hampshire. So potato history is a lot closer to home than I ever thought it was. All right, so now that I have some very, very yummy mashed potatoes, I'm going to take my milk and my flour. So I'm using a half cup of milk and a teaspoon of flour, and I'm going to actually heat those up over here on the stove top. Yay, I'm not, all right, we're going to keep that nice and low. Right there. Yeah, they're not. So you want to make sure that you really stir in all of your flour. Make sure that there's no lumps. And make sure that you're continuously stirring so you do not burn your milk. For those of you who attended Colonial Classics last month in January, when I made the savory Cheese. Wow, cheese, savory cheese pudding dinner. Uh, this is a bit similar. This recipe is a bit similar. I've made some tweaks and it tastes a lot better. This tastes a lot better than the, the January recipe. Uh, did anyone from the one that attended in January, did you try 
that one. One more try. It. Any responses there? So now that that's all mixed in, getting all warmed up, I'm going to add my mashed potatoes. I'm working over here. Holly, if you want to move over, if you can, I'm not sure. To the yeah, to watch out, guys. It's gonna get bumpy. Those of you who get motion sick, just pause. <laughs> All right, we're gonna put all of our potatoes in here and try not to splash ourselves with hot milk. There we go. Oh, that was a sound. All right, so we're gonna mix in to fully incorporate our potatoes with our. I've already burned myself once while making this recipe, so I'm gonna try and avoid doing that again. I'm, we are going to be using an iron skillet, which I'm not very well versed on. Uh, so that's what, how I ended up burning myself. Um, so be careful, guys. Make sure you always have the proper safe cooking equipment <laughs> nearby. As I'm splashing milk everywhere. Okay, so that's starting to incorporate. And so I'm going to pour in. So the recipe calls for salt and pepper. So a teaspoon of salt and then a one eighth a teaspoon of pepper which is i believe the technical term for that would be a pinch of pepper um, again if you're more on the salty side feel free to put a little bit more on that but this recipe is not going to hurt it's just going to add to the flavor and then i'm going to go a bit off script because this recipe reminds me a lot of I'm going to turn on our heat mat actually first. Before I tell you that, there we go. It's a little hot. Um, this recipe reminded me a lot of tortilla de patata, patatas, which I had when I was in Spain for study abroad. And that is very similar to this. You don't mash up your potatoes for that, you have slices. And in that, you have garlic and onion. So, what I've done is I've adapted. So, I've cut up some, some onions and minced some garlic and I put those in here. There are other things you can put in here. I consider maybe putting in some spinach. You can make it like, you can put some meat in here, which I think would be nice. Any questions so far in there? Here we go. So you wanna make sure that you're mixing this so that way there are no potato lumps. The recipe, the recipe says no lumps at all, but, um, you, when you've added onions, there's going to be lumpy onions. Your onions are not going to disintegrate. All right, so that looks really nice. Let's, there we go. Um, so now I'm just going to leave that there for a minute. I'm going to come over here, stand. Our beaten egg yolks. I'm just gonna use this. I tried to make as little of a mess with multiple pans as I could, but this really does call for a lot of pots and pans because you're frying this thing and then you're you're beating this thing and then you're kind of incorporating it without incorporating it. It gets all sorts of kafui. It's a technical term. Uh, <laughs> all right, so. Like I said, potatoes came to at least North America in 1619 with some Scotch Irish immigrants. And the way that there are, there are some legends to how potatoes actually got to Ireland, which is where we all usually think of potatoes. So we think of Ireland. And the first myth is that there was a, a a Spanish Armada ship that was wrecked and some potatoes <coughs> washed up on the Irish shore. Um, I'm pretty sure that probably, I, I don't think people would just take something that's 
washed up on the shore and just, oh, let's plant this. No. Um, so I'm guessing that's not how this works. Um, the other sort of legend that I think is a little bit more plausible is that there was Sir Walter Riley, Raleigh, 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 um, who plant brought potatoes from probably England because it had been introduced there already over to Ireland and planted them in his Irish estate. So that that's a little bit more plausible. All right, so those are all nice and mixed in. It's a little bit yellow from those yolks. All right, and that smells really good. You got a nice mix of the potato. I've got those onions cooked just a little bit while they're in there. That's why I kept the heat on to kind of cook those. Um, it'll give you a good texture. And of course, garlic, which I love. So any chance to put garlic in a recipe, I will take all right, so that I'm gonna put off to the side there. And now I have my egg yolk. So the eggs that I put in there, that was, sorry, this is the egg whites that I put in there was the egg yolks. Now the egg whites, we're going to beat until they have a stiff peak. So I'm actually gonna come over here a little bit and stiff peak. So this is a great time if anyone has any questions to type them in while I'm making a lot of noise. Um, <laughs> So, no questions yet? No, nothing. So, you're going to want to keep the dip and you'll start to see it. You'll start to see it become stiff because it'll get shiny. You want shiny. Anne would like to know how many eggs you use. I use three eggs, so it's three eggs separated. And you should probably use a bigger bowl than that I'm using right now, so that way your eggs are. Starting to get a little bit of shine, but it's still too bubbly and too runny. So we're gonna keep going. Shinier. Oh, almost there. It just it just flipped over. Hold on, I'll show you guys the food. I'll show you that oh, one. what type of potato did you use? Did you pick a certain kind? Um, I used a it's a white potato. Um, I did not use any russets, although that is what actually would have been used now that I've done some more research. A russet potato would have been used in this area because that is the one that was developed. So there's the russet Burbank potato, which was just not discovered. That's the wrong word I'm looking for. What was it? Created, I guess is the word. Developed. Develop, developed, thank you. Yes, was developed in Massachusetts. And it is where the Idaho potato dates back to. So you're welcome, Idaho, for your potato. <laughs> Uh, Nancy says, uh, and of course they beat the egg whites by hand. It's not easy if you've tried it. I have tried it. It is not fun. I do not recommend it. I tried doing it because my hand mixer actually broke. This is someone else's hand mixer. Um, and I tried doing it by hand once. It's not fun. My hand got so sore and I couldn't do it. Um, so now we've got our stiff, stiff peaks there. Stiffer. Let's get there. All right, and now we're going to gently incorporate this, okay? It's very important because this is your air. This is your rising agent, so that way it doesn't just go thunk. 
Um, so you're going to want to do this nice and gently with the, the circle and then down through the middle technique there, which if any of you have seen Great British Baking Show is a very, very classic. Um, <laughs> making sure that you are making, um, you are doing this nice and gently without knocking any of the air out. So uh, once you get used to it, you can pick up some speed. It does take a little bit for a little while for it to incorporate completely, but definitely worth it to take your time to make sure that you have the air in there. It's actually gonna gain some volume just with me doing this. So I've talked about how potatoes, the, the Spanish, and the Spanish found a handy use for the potatoes. They actually, so they were looking for gold, as, as you do when you're, when you're going over to the new world. Um, but they did find, um, well, they, they decided to bring back some potatoes, but they couldn't find gold. And they realized that sailors who ate the potatoes didn't get scurvy. So that is how potatoes became a staple on, on Spanish ships, is didn't, they didn't get scurvy. Seems like a good idea. So if any of you know any sort of traditional sailor recipes, they probably have potatoes in them. Because that was part of them. All right. Now, not everyone thought that the potato was so great. Um, a lot of countries actually thought it caused diseases, such as France, who thought it caused leprosy, among other diseases and things um, that we wouldn't consider diseases. And I'm blanking on them right now. But the main one that I really remember was leprosy. Um, so the French, although the potato had been introduced to France, was not very popular um, or didn't wasn't very, wasn't eaten very often until King Louis the 16th and Mary Antoinette. And it's because Mary Antoinette, one of the reasons, so the potato had been introduced to them by someone else, begins with a P, French name, unfortunately I forget his name, um, but he introduced, the, um, he wanted people to eat the potato because while he was a prisoner during the Seven Years' War, he lived off of the potatoes as a prisoner, that's what they gave him. So he's like, the potato is great. You can survive off of a potato. Eat potatoes. <laughs> Louis, eat potatoes. Uh, and so uh, they, they planted a whole bunch of potatoes and kept them under guard. Um, so that way townspeople would get curious and then made the guard go away and then people came and, and got interested in potatoes. And rumor has it that Mary Antoinette would wear the potato flour in her hair and King Louis would put it like in his button, hole, button pocket or and stuff. So it became very fashionable to wear potato flowers. <laughs> so before you actually get the potato, you have a nice, beautiful flower. Kelly, do we think it's Antoine Augustine Pommentier? Pommentier, yes, that is it. Thank you. Yeah. Pommentier. Look, fluffy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> pronunciation not good let's redirect um so yes um so i think that was that was a really really interesting so many really interesting little tidbits so like we have one country that is like this will solve all of our our problems on the ship and other people are just like don't do it it'll, it'll make you sick so definitely two sides of the spectrum all right now i'm going to take my iron skillet does anyone have an iron skillet at home I bought this one specifically for this because um, <laughs> I feel like something that people should have and that most people have. I just I just didn't have one. I don't know why I didn't have one. I feel like a lot of young people haven't worked up to getting them yet. <laughs> yes, I I am honestly scared of my iron skillet. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, um, and it's not just because I burned myself on it. <laughs> I, I'm okay, everything was fine. Um, but I accidentally grabbed the handle because I'm so used to things where you're able to grab the handle. Not a smart move on my part. Um, so we're gonna turn on the heat here. Um, Mary Ellen has one. Nice. All right, we're gonna go to about medium heat here. And Nancy says it's supposed to be healthy to cook in a cast iron skillet, but they're heavy. 
so heavy. It was not fun bringing this in today. <laughs> it was. It was not. I all. I always come. Everyone on site knows when it's a colonial classic state because I come in. I have my grocery bags one hand, all the stuff. But this. That's along with all of my other work things that I need. All right. So yes, I have my safety equipment. Um, I'm also worried about cleaning it because you have to make sure that you clean it in, in a certain way um, and immediately dry it. Uh, so Anne has one as well, and she says, use lemon and salt to clean, then season with oil. Ooh. Vegetal note. Going to keep that in mind. Thank you. Nancy agrees. Great. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's not, there we go. So we're going to let that heat up. And so the recipe does not tell you, even I did not tell you how much butter to put in, but it says to fry the bottom to make it brown. So I, I used two of the, the tablespoons. Yes. It's always the acronym, so I always want to make sure I get the right one. Um, two tablespoons, because that gives you enough butter that you're able to sort of fry the bottom, uh, but it's not too much, and not too little. So I felt like it was a good balance. Feel free to try more or less. I would be afraid with less, especially a pan this size, um, because you wouldn't, might not completely cover it. It's not really going to fry as well. Um, so, so, yes, we have this nice omelet color. So, yeah, we, we've got an omelet. Uh, <laughs> so that's actually what the tor tortilla de patata means. It's, it's like a Spanish omelet, Spanish potato omelet is what it means. So it reminds me of my time abroad, which I'm missing with the pandemic. Um, <laughs> so it was good to, to bring back that memory. I also, one of the reasons I associated this with comfort food is because of that trip. Plus omelets. I love omelets. They're my special weekend food. I sleep in and then I wake up and I make myself an omelet with whatever I have in the fridge. And it just makes me so happy. So that's usually my, my Saturday breakfast and then Sundays. Definitely pancakes. <laughs> Does anyone else have a particular comfort food, a breakfast comfort food that they have like on the weekends, special weekend treat? All right, it's warm enough. Sure. Push it back. It's very rude. <laughs> Ooh, Anne's a fan of Eggs Benedict. Ooh, that's a, that's a good treat. Haven't had that in a while. Oh, and banana pancakes from Anne Herring. So if I have banana pancakes, it also has to have peanut butter. Ooh. That's a personal favorite for me. Julie's a fan of French toast on the weekends. Nancy does eggs benedict, but sometimes with hash browns, we call them eggs Irish. Oh, yes, I heard those. I have never tried them. Would like to try. And then Aunt Amy says, I made vanilla eggnog French toast a couple weeks ago with maple bourbon syrup, which sounds delightful. <laughs> <laughs> I need to remember these. I need you guys, when I send you the, the thank you email, send me recipes. <laughs> Just go ahead and share those. That'd be great. I'm always looking for new recipes to share. So I have the Duchess blog. Recipe is from the Duchess blog. Duchess? <laughs> Love. Very fancy. I love that. All right. So I have melted all of my butter. And so the trick to doing this is you are going to try and do it as fast as possible, which I know sounds great. So my heat is up a bit. It's not, not all the way on high, but it's a little bit more than medium because you want to try and almost immediately fry and kind of create a layer on the bottom. So you already want to just to oh, see me attempt to not make this go everywhere. All right, and we're dropping. There we go. We can hear a bit of the frying sound. I'm just going to spread that all out nice and even, as even as we can. All right, I'm just going to leave that there for a second. I get impatient and I poke at it a bunch. So please try to avoid doing that. Please be better than me. Um, don't get too, too much. But yes, we have a little bit of our onion in there. And so the onion, I can smell that cooking. And the potato. 
it smells really good in here. <laughs> it's just so much, it's more potato. Uh, I added more potato. The recipe calls for about a cup of potato. Uh, I used four potatoes, which is a little bit more than um, but I think um, that's fine. It's worked out well. The first time I made this, I made it according to the recipe. It worked, it's just very bland. Um, so I recommend, at least if you're gonna try the first time, maybe putting your own, I already know it works. You already know it works, so just add your own thing to it. Uh, have some fun. Why not? Add your favorite, okay, I don't know if favorite vegetable would work. I don't know if all vegetables would work anywhere as much. It might. I feel like a, um, like a mushroom might work mushroom. or maybe um, like a bell pepper. Bell pepper would be good. Yeah, basically anything that you can put in an omelet would be good. Um, we're starting to get some bubbles around the edge. That's good. Yeah. Just keeping an eye on it. The first time I made this, I did burn it on the bottom of it. But that's also, I really like using the gas stove with this, especially with my iron skillet. Because at home, I have an electric stove. Yeah. It was an experience. <laughs> uh, and it worked. It, it happened. It did, it did what I wanted it to do. Uh, but I was nervous about it not cooking fully. And so I left it. I had my, my heat. Like I said, I was afraid of my iron skillet. My instruction said not to overheat your iron skillet. And so I started on a low temperature and I was going to let it just slowly fry. Don't let it slowly fry. <laughs> Turn up your heat, put it all in there, and wait a second. <laughs> wait a minute. So Nancy says, all these sound great, and we're having a snow slash ice storm this weekend. Need come for breakfast. Woo! Oh, the weekend storms, man. Yeah. And that they were probably happy to have potatoes back then. We are so spoiled. <laughs> yes. Yes, potatoes definitely are. Because you have to have them transport. But potatoes did become a staple a little after 17, so 1719 was when in Londonderry, New Hampshire, that's when those, those Scotch-Irish Scotch immigrants came and settled there. And that is the first permanent um, potato patch. So potatoes had been introduced here and there around the colonies before then, but that was the first permanent one. And from there, it spread across the colonies um, and later on. And so that's how, so uh, John Turner II, would have been alive in the House of Seven Gables around then, around when this explosion of potato, <laughs> fancy, um, <laughs> um, trend would have, would have come about. So it's possible that something maybe similar to this would have been eaten at the House of the Seven Gables, which I always like to find those connections because they're always fun. And then Anne says she'd like to add spinach and cheese to her. Yes, I did consider cheese. Um, but based, I think that would have made it a little bit too much like the recipe I just made um, the last one. So I didn't want to try and replicate exactly. Um, but I think cheese would work. You want a cheese that melts really well in with this. Oh, we're getting a little brown on the bottom. Almost there. You really got to take the, the lip on the side and kind of look under because it's not going to brown so much on the sides. It's really under that you got to make sure you're so and as soon as that browns, that's when it's going into your oven. Um, and the instructions say to wait till the top browns. The top doesn't really brown as much. Like it becomes a crusty layer. And when you poke your fork into it or your toothpick, it's going to come back as not like with, without anything on it. Okay, that has a nice little golden brown. But I'm sorry you guys can't see because I'm just like, Ooh, I can barely see it. Um, but that is a nice little golden brown on the bottom. So I'm gonna put that, I'm gonna turn off my heat, and that's gonna go into my oven, which is preheated for 400 degrees. Oh, you might need, since, you know, the skillet is extremely heavy, you might want someone to help you with that, especially if you do decide to whip your eggs by hand. Um, <laughs> definitely make sure that either you have massive muscles or you have a helper. <laughs> so that is going to stay in there. Recommend about 15 minutes, okay, at 400. That has worked out well for me. I tried it on five minutes because I was worried with the temperature and since egg, it cooks pretty quickly, but especially with how thick it is, it's cooking at a good consistency. I'll grab the, grab the sample over here. 
So it's going to have this nice little spongy, spongy bit, but it's, it has a crust and everything on it. Oh, am I not over the side? There we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a nice crust. All right. Are there any questions in there? Uh, Nancy pointed out that uh, so today we say, wonder what I can get at the market to add to this back then. Hmm, wonder what I have in the root cellar. The root cellar, yes, in your cellar, what you have, um, whatever you have available, especially um, if you didn't have a market nearby or you couldn't afford to just go to the market. Um, the Turners were very lucky. They were very wealthy um, with that um, seafaring trade that they had. So they were able to afford the salt, the pepper that went into this, just those simple things that we take for granted today. Um, having milk. Um, we know we knew that there were cows on these grounds, not necessarily when the Turners were here, um, but Susanna Ingersoll had some cows, I believe. Um, so that's a little bit in the 1800s, so a little bit farther. Um, but yeah, cows on the premises. Um, I believe some remains, some bones from cows was actually discovered during an archeological dig on site. Don't quote me on that. I got that from an oral history. So <laughs> it's a source reading from a source. So. Um, Anne wonders how many servings for this recipe? How many servings for this recipe? Goodness. Actually, this is what I'd say six to 10, depending on how big you want the slices to be. It's a timer. It's gonna burn. Hold on. <laughs> Something that I always forget to do, especially during colonial process, is set myself a timer. I just put it in and go. Ah, it actually happens. Um, another fun fact that I found very fun um, and upset all my coworkers. <laughs> Does anyone know the first vegetable to be grown in space? Any guesses? based on this meal. It's not a rhetorical. You guys can type into the chat. It's okay. Potatoes. Potatoes, exactly. Potatoes were grown October 1995 in space, which means I am a few months older than the first vegetable grown in space, which upset all of my coworkers who were older than me. <laughs> so yes, 1990, October 1995, potatoes grown in space. Woo. <laughs> And says it's in the Matt Damon movie about space. Oh my gosh, really? I haven't seen that one. <laughs> That's great. No, I need to see that movie. You guys are giving me some great things to do during these storms. Um, so yes, that is going to just sit in there. So if there are any last minute questions, we are hoping for, so while I'm wanting to see if anyone goes in the chat, we do have a few events that are coming up that are going to so our next event that we have in February, so although we're close to the public, we are opening for some special events in person, woo, but outside, safe. Um, so on the 12th of February, we have family snow sculpting. So pray for snow the day before there, so that way we have some snow to be able to make snowmen or castles or whatever it is you want to make with your family. On the 13th, we have a Valentine scavenger hunt. We're partnering with Salem Rec. Um, and so those two events are for Salem So Sweet. So there's gonna be some great events going around all over Salem. Those are just the two that are happening on our site. And then later on that week, on the 16th, we have a lecture that's going to be about the history of, uh, oh wow, plus my, um, about New England, um, Essex, history um, and connected to um, early black history in this area. Um, we have a great speaker that's going to be that. That one's virtual. That one's virtual. The other two in person, that one's virtual. And then I think that's what we have for February. And then March is our last Colonial Classic for the season. And we're making some ice cream. It's on March 2nd. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> I don't know what I do without her. Um, so yes, that's gonna be our last one of this series, coffee ice cream. So we're gonna see how that goes. We're gonna hope for some warmer weather, even though the groundhog just wants us to stay in the cold weather. You saw in the shadow, we have more winter to come. So please stay warm and stay safe. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your night.